okay, say, well, it's not even realistic. It's extremely optimistic of alpha of 20, okay? And you take the 200 megawatts that Chang via cites as his requirement. 200 megawatts times 20 tons per megawatt is 4,000 tons of high technology equipment that would need to be launched to orbit. The HAB for the Mars mission only weighs about 40 tons. So you've got an engine that weighs 100 times as much as the payload that it's pushing. Okay? And you've got to deliver this stuff, and not just, by the way, to low Earth orbit. You have to deliver it to a intermediate, uh, say, a thousand mile orbit, because this thing, when it starts up, it's going to be really hot. Okay, it, it, the, 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 it, this becomes an extremely radioactive object, and the no one is going to let you start one of these things in um, you know 150 mile orbit, where if you, then the engine fails, it's going to re-enter and and, and 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 scatter radioactive debris all over the place. In in in. Uh, you know, the Topaz eventually ended up in Canada. Um, so the Canadians right now have the um, largest space nuclear power reactor. Um, okay. um, um, it's available for anyone who can find it. Uh, the, uh, but the, uh, so this is gigantic. How are you going to launch it? How are you going to assemble it? How are you going to get it to that orbit? How are you going to service it when it comes back from Mars? Okay, how are you going to refuel it? Now we come to the orbital fuel depot. Orbital fuel, we've got to have an orbital fuel depot. Why do we need an orbital fuel depot? We need an orbital fuel depot because developing heavy lift is just too hard. It's too expensive. It's, it's beyond our capabilities. That was the sort of thing that the giants who inhabited America in the 1960s were capable of, but not us. Okay, we're too small. Uh, and the, um, okay, so, but, now there's nothing impossible, obviously, about heavy lift because it's been done. But the, this now assumes that. Now furthermore, if you have this, and therefore you rule out heavy lift. We're not developing heavy lift because we're developing an orbital fuel depot. Now you are forced to do the Mars mission by on-orbit assembly from a large number of medium launch vehicles. Okay. So it drives you in, in other words, in order for the orbital fuel, fuel depot to be necessary, you must not have heavy lift and you must be doing the mission from a large number of launches of medium lift vehicles. Now, I actually was hired by NASA to do a review of uh, a moon mission scenario for, by Admiral Steidel when he was head of the exploration office. And this involved four launches of medium lift vehicles per lunar mission. And when you actually worked through the problem and the several Earth orbit rendezvous and lunar orbit rendezvous required for each mission, the need for launch not just successful launch of four launchers per mission, but on time launch of three of the four. And now, the, you know, the people who designed these uh, medium lift rockets will tell you, oh, this has a reliability of 0 0.99978. Okay, but the uh, real demonstrated reliability of these systems is more like 0 0.95, okay? Some of them as low as 0.9, but okay, we'll give them 0.95 as, as, as something. Okay, now you're launching four of them per mission. Right there, that's a 20% chance of complete mission failure. One of them goes in the drink. But it's worse than that because the on-time reliability of these things is more like 0.5. Okay, that is, uh, you know, uh, as you know, it is extremely common occurrence for launches to be delayed. It's in no way exceptional, um, and sometimes for months. Um, so uh, in this case of this lunar architecture, three of the four involve propellants, and these are cryogenic propellants that evaporate uh, if they're left on orbit for excessive amounts of time. So if the launch sequence gets hang hung up halfway through the, the program there, or, or the sequence of a given launch, then the propellant you launched in an earlier launch is, starts boiling away and there's an inadequate amount of it to, to do the mission. 
so the mission fails. So this was a four medium lift launch lunar mission. Now let's take this a step further. Let's talk about a Mars mission with perhaps four times the launch mass of a lunar mission. Now, now we're talking about 16 medium lift launches and you have on orbit assembly uh, and all this. Now then you have, oh, oh but okay, okay we're going to be storing some of the propellant at the orbital depot so we only have to launch you know six or seven of these things to assemble the complex and the others will also have to launch a whole bunch of other uh, medium lift launch vehicles to gas up the fuel depot which can allegedly store this fuel for long periods of time so that it's ready to go when you need it. All right, well now, first of all, in terms of cost, if you look at launch vehicles, what you find is that the cost of launch per pound to orbit decreases as the launch vehicle gets bigger. The most expensive launch vehicle with a uh, cost per pound to orbit is the Pegasus. Okay? The cheapest launch vehicle uh, with a cost per pound to orbit was Saturn V. The, and it, it's basically, if you graph it, you know, there's, there's differences because there's different nationalities and Russians have lower costs and stuff. But the, um, it basically, uh, the cost of the launch vehicle goes up as about the square root of its payload. So you can get four times the payload at double the cost. Uh, so it's more economical to do it with heavy, so by insisting on doing it with smaller launches, you're increasing the total cost simply on the tonnage basis. But now you have to have all the technologies required for on-orbit assembly, and not only on-orbit assembly, reliable. Okay, now you're constructing an airplane in flight. Okay, um, it's, it's easier to do this on the ground, you, you know, and they be reused. Okay, so this thing is flown to Mars and back, and now it's up there in high Earth orbit, and you have to have telerobotic servicing of this thing to check out all the little thrusters, some of which will have burnt out uh, during the round trip. And then there's the reactor itself and all the rest. And, um, and this whole giant telerobotic servicing operation has got to be going on up there. So it is not too much to s and well, of course, and then the crew has to be ferried to the Vasemir as well. Um, uh, and so you have uh, orbital taxis thrown into this business. Uh, compare this to the Mars Direct or the Semi Direct, where you lift and throw, or even if you don't even use ISRU, and you have four or five individual heavy lift launches, each of which throw a payload to Mars in a discrete amount, and they land near each other, and then you come back. Okay. The, the, um, um, you could not come up with a more complex scenario. In other words, if you envision the Mars mission in this way, with gigantic space nuclear power systems and sets of thrusters and uh, that all have to be assembled on orbit and serviced on orbit and there's orbital depots and ferries going from one to the other and telerobotic servicing and you have created a kind of a parallel universe okay I mean literally you've created this entire you, you're not just building a mission here you're building an alternate reality okay and if you think of the Mars mission in this way then this is clearly not something that is occurring in the present era it is not occurring within the general reality that we live in. It's in the world of the future with orbiting spaceports and robots and things and, and all this stuff. You, you were just removing it. So that, um, none of this, the idea of engineering is not to do things in the most complex way possible, it's to do things in the simplest way possible. Okay? To not try to develop uh, the, the maximum amount of technology to accomplish your mission, but to be able to do the mission with the minimum amount of new technology development. Okay? The, the technology driven approach, okay, um, which basically uses which in fact really is a constituency driven approach, but it uses the Mars mission as a Christmas tree uh, to be used to hang on it as ornaments, the largest number of ornaments. 
Okay? So you design the most complex mission you possibly can. But th and the mission then becomes impossible, but that's almost irrelevant because the, the purpose of the mission plan is not to fly a mission. It's to justify these programs. But since that is the purpose of the mission, it must use these programs. And so it never happens. Okay? It never happens. It can't happen. Uh, this is what killed the Space Exploration Initiative back in 1989-1990. The insistence that uh, there was a whole bunch of, of you know, well, the space station program, of course, that was the elephant in the room. And then there was a shuttle, which is another elephant in the room. And then there was a whole bunch of NASA technology managers. There was this guy at Marshall, and this guy at Lewis, and this guy at JSC, and so forth. And they all wanted to make their technologies mission critical. So you had to have a plan that incorporated all of these technology programs as mission critical. So you got the most complex uh, moon mission design, let alone Mars mission design. That's how they got to $400 billion. Okay. Um, and this, um, that, that is what we're, we're going on here. The, 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 the proper way to do the mission, if you really want to do the mission, is you sit down and think, what is the simplest way to do the mission? How do we do this with what we have now? If we can't quite do it with what we have now, how do we do it with the fewest additional things beyond what we have now? And the simplest possible approach, the, simple, the minimum number of operations, the minimum number of added infrastructure, Okay, we don't want to have to build, you know, we already just spent 15 years building a space station. Now we're going to spend another 15 years building a gas station. Um, and the, uh, you, you, you know, this is, this is what, what is involved. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, just imagine if back in the days of, of the development of aviation, that it had been more government controlled than it is and there had been a big government research agency and someone at one of the aeronautical research centers had this idea of flying refueling stations carried by blimps. And, um, okay, but now you actually can do aerial refueling and there's a use for it, but imagine if you impose that as a requirement on the airplanes that they refuel at the blimps when they're flying from New York to Cincinnati. Um, and, 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 but furthermore, the, anyway, the, th that's what we have here. So that, that is the problem with this entire approach. The, um, I think I made myself clear. I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, Andy. So, so how, do, how do we expose this farce to the American people or to, or to the government? Well, I, I think we do have to expose it fairly mercilessly. Uh, you know, we do have to make clear, this is not, uh, okay, A, I mean, there's a couple of things here. Number one, you set the goal beyond the time horizon that requires you to do anything effective towards accomplishing it. That's not a goal, that's a dream, okay? But then, furthermore, you say you're working towards it when you do in other words, they're going to put an electric thruster up on the space station in a couple of years. And uh, it actually, I think, is a 100 kilowatt thruster that they're planning. And I don't think it's actually a Vasimir. Uh, I think it's a, going to be an ion thruster, which Vasimir has additional problems. It needs a superconducting magnet that does this. The ion thrusters are a bit simpler. But they're both ultimately subject to the same equations of the power. But anyway, they're going to put this thing up there. They're going to fire it for 10 minutes because even though the space station as a whole has 75 kilowatts, you can't take all 75 kilowatts and put it in this one part of the station and fire a thruster. They're going to fire it off of batteries, okay, and the, for like 10 minutes, and then they're going to have a picture of the, you know, uh, ion plume and so forth, and they're going to say, wow, we've just demonstrated the breakthrough technology that will allow us to fly to Mars in 39 days, and it's going to have to be exposed as utter bunk, okay? Because uh, um, it's a pretense of progress when they're making none. The American people will need to know that this is a fraud, that they're not going to get away.